Okay, well, thanks for the invitation. And uh, Roger's specific instructions were that it's not possible for me to make this talk too basic, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So, so I think there will be a more technical talk next week in the Gravity program. So uh, I'll do a Blackboard talk and get into some details <laughs> then. Uh, so you can save some of your questions. The experts can save some of their questions for next week. OK. Um, right. So this is <laughs> I'll start basic. This has been, uh, over the past decades, one of the big challenges in theoretical physics, trying to fit the theory of gravity into the framework of quantum mechanics. Okay. And so just to emphasize, when we're talking about gravity, um, we're, the thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about geometry. So we're talking about the dynamics of space-time and its interaction with matter. Okay. And of course, this, this came from Einstein. Um, and so, so it's kind of this picture that we're trying to fit within the framework of quantum mechanics. So in particular, we want some theory where the different quantum states would actually describe different geometries. Okay. And, and this has been a difficult problem. Okay. So we'll jump ahead to 1997. And uh, so, so there's been remarkable progress in this area um, coming through the ADS <coughs> correspondence in string theory. Um, that you heard about a little bit uh, on, on Monday in Don's talk. And the idea is that certain theories of quantum gravity, um, you can exactly describe them as ordinary quantum systems without gravity. So, so certain quantum systems, turning them around, certain quantum systems on a fixed space-time background um, can be understood in a certain way um, as describing gravitational physics. So the way that this would, the way this works in general, is that we start with our quantum system. Often it's a quantum field theory on a on a fixed space-time background. We can consider different states of that theory: the vacuum or a state with a little bit of energy or a lot of energy, and for each of these, there's some kind of alternative interpretation of the physics where, say, to the vacuum state, we could associate some empty space-time. To this state, we might associate uh, the same space-time with a little bit of energy, say, a gravity wave on that background. And for this quantum field theory state that has a lot of energy, that might correspond to a space-time with a black hole. And so there are, you know, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that this works. Over the last 17 years, there are now probably 10,000 papers checking various aspects of this and doing calculations on one side and comparing with calculations on the other side. Um, but um, remarkably, there's still some really big questions um, that are not satisfactor satisfactorily answered. Okay, so, so how and why? does space-time and gravitational physics emerge from this quantum field theory dynamics? Um, do all the states in the field theory have gravity interpretations, or is it just some special states? And if so, which ones? Um, and well, what, what new can we learn about gravity using this? So something really exciting in the last, um, particularly the last decade, but, but it's, it's been accelerating, so, so there's more and more um, interest in this area, um, is that the physics of quantum information, the physics of entanglement um, in the field theory seems to be crucial to think about in order to understand really how this ADS CFT works, and how geometry is emerging, and how gravity is emerging. Okay. So one of the first hints of this uh, was a paper by Moldesina um, quite a while ago. And 
he was just uh, uh, considering the question of um, how do you describe within this framework um, an interesting kind of space time where you really have two separate space times containing black holes, but the, but the space times are connected behind the horizon of the black hole. This is the kind of space time that you learn about when you, when you first write down short shield metrics in general relativity, and then you realize that you could actually extend them um, past the horizon in a non-singular way uh, near the horizon, and then actually extend them maximally into some other second asymptotic region. So Maldacena wanted to say, understand, uh, if we could describe these kinds of space times in the context of the ADS-CFT <laughs> correspondence, and his proposal was that this particular space-time corresponds to having two separate copies of this field theory that has a gravitational dual. And the two copies are not interacting at all. They're just absolutely separate physical systems. Okay. But of course, the Hilbert space for that is the tensor product of the two Hilbert spaces. And we can consider states that are entangled between the two sides. And Maldacena wrote down a particular entangled state um, of this system of two field theories. Um, this is just a schematic representation. There are some coefficients here. Um, but this would be like vacuum in one, tensor with vacuum in the other, plus, a, plus this state in one and the same state in the other, et cetera. Okay? So the key point is that this is some, some highly entangled state of the two sides. And the interpretation is that you've managed to, um, on the gravity side, actually f connect these two different space times, even though the two field theories are not interacting at all. Okay, so that's some connection between entanglement and space time connectivity. Um, going back to the case where you just have one of those field theory states, though, okay, so we, we said that if you just have the vacuum of a field theory, that corresponds to an empty space-time. Okay, but as most of you know, um, if we're talking about the vacuum state of a, of a quantum field theory, there's plenty of entanglement there already. If I consider any region, then the fields in that region are highly entangled with the fields outside that region. And so an interesting question to ask is whether whether that entanglement has anything to do with, um, with the fact that there's a space-time there in this dual description. Okay. If in Maldacena's example, entangling two separate CFTs connected up two space-times, can we, can we say that this entanglement that's already there in the single thing um, is related to the fact that you have this big connected space-time? So you can do a thought experiment where you start with a vacuum state of, a, of your field theory and just arbitrarily divide it in half, divide the space in half that the field theory lives on. And uh, so, so in our starting point, that's dual to this big empty space time. And now we consider a family of states of the field theory. Okay, starting from the vacuum, we perturb the state in such a way that the entanglement across that arbitrary divide is becoming less and less. And we do this in a way where, in, you know, the example I want to choose is one where I can figure out what the dual gravity interpretation is. And what happens in the examples that can be calculated um, is that this big empty space time that you start with, once you start disentangling these two sides, the space time starts splitting off, it starts stretching out so the two sides are getting further apart and, in a sense, the the region connecting these two sides of the space-time is, is pinching off. Okay. And you could continue to do that if you wanted to. You could, you could further subdivide your field theory and start removing more and more entanglement. And the conclusion seems to be is that if, if you start removing all this entanglement, that the space-time geometry in the dual interpretation, it just splits off into bits. Okay. Going the other way, you could say that the space-time, the big connected space-time, um, it's emerging by this entanglement that you have in the, in the vacuum state of the field theory. 
So you can make fairly dramatic statements um, that would be really surprising. Um, um, but of course, we want to be more quantitative than that. Okay, so that that's an interesting set of statements. But how do you, how do you make it precise? Okay. So it turns out that the first hints of uh, a quantitative picture, or how to make this quantitative, uh, actually came in the 1970s. Okay. And so those hints were related to the connection between areas of black hole horizons and entropies. Okay, so, so it was observed that areas of black hole horizons have many of the properties obeyed by entropies in thermodynamic systems. Okay. Classically, they increase. Um, there's an there's a analog of the first law of thermodynamics for black hole horizons where the energy is interpreted <coughs> as mass and the area is interpreted as entropy. Okay. So there are all these analogies. Okay. And over the, over the time since then, um, we've understood or we, or we believe that um, it's not a coincidence okay. that the reason that area has all these properties like entropy is that you can actually interpret black hole uh, horizon areas as thermodynamic entropies. So this is particularly clear in ADS-CFT, okay, in a case where we really um, think we know the underlying microscopic physics of this gravitational theory. The idea would be that when you have a black hole in your space-time, this corresponds to the field theory in a particular um, state, which is a thermal state. Okay. So this is, this is an ensemble. Um, and so you have various probabilities for the states in the ensemble. And you can calculate the entropy of that ensemble. And this is the thing that we're identifying. So according to this correspondence, the area of this horizon is the entropy of that ensemble of CFT states. Okay. Ryu and Takinagi thought of a way to generalize this. And so what they did, so here we, here we connected the entropy of the entire, of the state of the entire CFT to the area of this black hole horizon. Ryu and Takinagi realized that you can actually give a geometric, or propose that you can actually give a geometric interpretation, uh, not just to the entropy of the entire CFT, but to the entropy of subsystems of the CFT. So I have to tell you what I mean by the entropy of a subsystem of a general state. And it's not a thermodynamic entropy in general. Okay. So given any quantum system with a subsystem A, okay. well, it's well known that you can't describe that subsystem. So given a state of the full theory, you can't describe the state of the subsystem um, as some pure state of that subsystem. Okay. There's no, not in general going to be some pure state uh, for which all the observables agree with the observables calculated in this state. Um, but what you can do is s describe the subsystem as some ensemble. Okay? So you can always find an ensemble of orthogonal states here with some probabilities for those states, such that observables in the subsystem calculated in the ensemble match with observables in the global state. And of course, this connects with the idea of entanglement. If, you're if, you're, if you have to consider an ensemble rather than a pure state, we say that the state is entangled. The subsystem is entangled with the rest. The fact that you have these various probabilities, um, it's just like in that thermodynamic ensemble. There's some classical uncertainty about the state of A. And again, it makes sense to quantify that uncertainty using exactly the same formula for entropy. Okay. So given, given any quantum system for the subsystem, we can talk about the entropy of the subsystem in any particular state. Okay. And it doesn't re rely on any particular coarse graining. This is some exact quantum calculation. Okay. Um, 
So we can do this for the kinds of, uh, for the kinds of quantum systems that come into this ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay, those are often quantum field theories. One thing to say about quantum field theory um, subsystem entropies is that they're divergent. But there are many sensible quantities that we can define. Okay, so, so there are various ways, even though, even though that subsystem entropy is divergent in the continuum limit, you can talk about um, the difference in, in uh, subsystem entropy or entanglement entropy um, for some state compared to what the entanglement entropy would be in the vacuum state. Okay. Or you could talk about uh, other quantities like mutual information given two different regions, the entanglement entropy of one plus the entanglement entropy of the other minus the entanglement entropy of the union is something that is well-defined and finite. Okay. Okay, so what did, what did uh, Ryu and Takianagi how did they connect this with uh, geometry? Okay. So you could start with uh, a really simple example that most of you are familiar with. Um, so this is one plus one dimensional. This is in a one plus one dimensional conformal field theory. We have this universal answer. If you go ahead and do the calculation of what the entanglement entropy um, for an interval is in the vacuum state of the conformal field theory. Okay. And what Ryu and Takinagi realized is that that answer can be given a geometric interpretation. Okay. And so the, the geometric interpretation is in terms of this thing that Don explained on Monday, anti de Sitter space. Um, if you're not comfortable with metrics, I've, <laughs> I've drawn uh, lizards to help you. <laughs> Escher has drawn lizards to help you. Uh, so. Uh, so, the, so another way, an alternative way of understanding what, what the spatial geometry of anti de Sitter space is, is that, well, it's this space where physical distances are measured in lizards. <laughs> okay. And so what, uh, what Ryu and Takinagi realized, what they said was that um, if, you, if you, you can set up the following geometric question. Okay, so you take some interval on the boundary of this space, okay? And then you find the path from this one, this point to this point, that crosses the least number of lizards, okay? That, that's the least uh, physical distance. And because you notice that the lizards get more dense out towards the boundary, you actually get, it's actually advantageous to go on a path through the middle of the space, okay? And so if you work out, well, what is the area, what is, sorry, what is the length of that uh, curve? Um, in this particular geometry, the answer is the same answer as we had for the calculation of entanglement entropy for an interval in a conformal field theory. Okay. So there's, there's this, in a sense, you can think of this geometry as being a geometrical representation of the entanglement structure of that conformal field theory. This turns out to work in higher dimensions as well. So in higher dimensions, um, instead of an interval in a one plus one dimensional CFT, we can consider a ball-shaped region in a higher dimensional conformal field theory. And so the analogous statement is that if you, if you calculate the entanglement entropy of such a region in the vacuum state of a higher dimensional conformal field theory, okay, it also matches with the answer to a geometrical problem, which is to calculate the area of the minimal area surface in this higher dimensional version of anti de Sitter space. Okay. Okay. So this is a statement about arbitrary CFTs. And it's restricted to particular shaped regions, ball-shaped regions. But what Ryu and Takianagi uh, conjectured was that the same relation holds in these special holographic theories, these theories with gravity duals. This same relation holds for general states and for general regions. And that would be like a key to understanding the geometry 
given a state of one of these holographic theories. Okay, so let me just go through how you would do that. Okay, so let's let's say their let's say their conjecture is true, and now someone gives you uh, a state of a field theory, which is in one of these holographic theories, and so it has a gravity dual interpretation. And you want to understand what is the geometry um, of space-time in the dual picture. Okay. Well, you start with this state, and then you start computing entanglement entropies for lots of different regions. <coughs> and then you ask the question, can I find a space-time for which the answer to the geometrical question of finding these areas matches with the entanglement entropies that I calculate. Okay, so, so if you've succeeded, then you've got a space time here. And for any region on the boundary, you compute the extremal area surface. You calculate its area. And then you check. And you should find that that matches with the entanglement entropy for that region in the state that you started with. So that would be that would be a way to start with a state and then basically deduce a geometry. Okay, so we could buy this Ryutaki and Agi formula and actually this this generalization to um, uh, time dependent space times was by uh, Hubini and Ragamani and Taki and Agi. Um, so using this formula, you can plausibly reconstruct a geometry from entanglement structure just from the information about the entanglement. Yes? Is it obvious it's one to one? It's not one to one. And yeah, it's, it's, de it's certainly not obvious. And this is, <laughs> the rest of the talk is, uh, is going to be about in interpreting and learning from the failure of, of this map to be one to one. Okay. Actually, in general, the question sounds very overdetermined. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. OK. So, um, so right, one could. One could ask, like, what was special about these holographic field theories? Couldn't I just do that procedure for any field theory? You give me a state, I calculate all the entanglement entropies, and then find the geometry that matches with those. Okay. Um, but generally, you'll fail. Okay. Usually, almost always, um, there will be no space-time geometry for which the areas of these extremal surfaces match with the entanglement entropies that you calculate in your field theory state. OK. So yeah. So like an explicit example of when it fails? Choose any state of any field theory. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, with an extraordinarily high probability, it will fail. <laughs> okay. But I'll give, I'll, I'll say, I'll say some more uh, explicit things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really want to, it's, it's, it's certainly the, the entanglement structure that allows this um, is, is very, very highly constrained. Okay. Um, so just to graphically represent that statement. Um, OK, so this is the set. This is supposed to be the set of, <coughs> of geometries. OK, um, we're, okay so, so in this ADS-CFT correspondence, um, I glossed over it because Don had talked about it in detail on Monday. But, but the kinds of geometries that we're talking about um, um, are geometries which, out towards the boundary, they look just like this anti de Sitter space. And then some things could happen in the middle. So the, the class of geometries that we're talking about, where, it's, where, where you can define this sensible problem of computing extremal areas, are, are these anti asymptotically anti de Sitter space times. Okay. So these are these. One way to describe these is by some metric functions. Okay. So this is like a a handful of functions of four coordinates or five, depending on how many dimensions you're in. Okay. So this is. This is the set of asymmetrically <coughs> considered space times. Um, the set of possible entanglement structures, well, an, you know, an entanglement structure, when you talk about the entanglement, you could choose any region um, of the boundary, and then you get a number 
which is the entanglement of that region. Okay, so, the, so on this side, um, these are like functions of subsets of a space. Okay, and that's that's a, a far larger set of things. Yeah. When you say not consistent with gravity field, you mean with gravity field with one smooth boundary, or do you, you think adding all the horizons or holes, they'll still not be able to? Well, well let me make, let me just make the statement first. So. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> So the point is that, you know, Ryu Takinagi, so if I start with one of these things here, this is an example of a, spa a particular space time, okay? Well, then I could just use the Ryu Takinagi formula, compute all of the, compute the extremal area surface for any region, and that would place me um, somewhere in this big space of functions of subsets, okay? But, so the statement is just that since this space is much, much smaller, okay, and this Ryu Takinagi goes from here to here, um, you're going to end up on a tiny subset of these functions, okay? And so, as I was saying, if you just chose a general state of a general field theory and computed the entanglement entropies, you'd end up somewhere in this big ball, but it seems unlikely that you'd end up on that one. Yeah? Uh, is it clear that it's a, it's a subset in the other way? So if I, if I have a function that came from the geometric thing, is it clear that I can cook up a state that will satisfy it? It's, have yeah, it's not true either, oh. and, and that's, <laughs> that's going to be the, another interesting thing. So let's let's stick with this um, with this part. Okay, so um, okay, so so you could ask um, uh, what would be an example of some constraints on entanglement that I that I could that I could get. Okay, so the the point is that the the states where entanglement is described geometrically. Um, are very special states. The entanglement is very constrained. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, so this is now, this is now um, just for simplicity, I'm, I'm going to look at a, a slightly more restricted, well, a more restricted set of, of uh, geometries, okay? just because it's easy to describe them. So let's think about states that would be dual to vacuum solutions of Einstein equations. Okay, so we know one, one such state is the vacuum of a conformal field theory, um, and there's uh, of a holographic conformal field theory, and then that would be dual to just empty anti de Sitter space. Um, but there's lots of other vacuum solutions of Einstein's equations. You could have a bunch of gravitational waves or something more nonlinear. Um, okay. So here's, here's the geometry. Now, if I know the entanglement entropy for infinitesimal regions in this field theory state. Okay. Um, oh, some things disappeared. Okay. So, so according to Ryu Takinagi, um, that would tell me about the areas of surfaces that just go a little ways into the space time. Okay, so so if, if I know the entanglement entropy of, say, a tiny little ball-shaped region here, um, that would tell me about the area of a surface that goes a tiny ways into this space time. Okay. And it turns out that using that information um, is enough to tell me about the asymptotic metric of the space time. Okay. I won't go through the, the technical details. Um, part of that is that knowing the entanglement entropy for an infinitesimal ball shaped region is equivalent to knowing the stress energy tensor. So long as I consider regions um, in different frames of reference. Okay, so if I, so just a general, if I look at the entanglement entropy in a, in a ball-shaped region in the limit where the ball goes to zero, um, from that I can read off the expectation value of the stress-energy tensor uh, component t zero zero, and then if I look at other frames, I could read off the full stress-energy tensor. Um, and in this ADS-CFT correspondence, knowing that uh, allows us to figure out the asymptotic metric. But since we assumed that the geometry was uh, one of these, was a vacuum solution to Einstein's equations, okay, we can, as Don um, described the other day, uh, integrate these in equations um, in a radial direction, at least some distance. We might run into some problems, but at least some distance in, we could reconstruct the metric. And then using Ryu Takinagi, we could go backwards and compute the entanglement entropy for any other region, since now we know the metric, we can now compute extremal surfaces and compute the entanglement entropy. 
Okay. So th the bottom line of all that um, is, is a type of uh, constraint on quantum field theory states that have gravity duals of this type. And the constraint is that the full entanglement structure, the entanglement entropy for any region, could be determined by this local data, by the entanglement entropy for um, infinitesimal regions, or equivalently by the stress energy tensor. Okay. So that's, that's extremely constrained. In general, there's no reason why I should be able to figure out the entanglement entropy for a large region from the entanglement entropies for infinitesimal regions. By infinitesimal, you mean still large compared with the UV cutoff, do you? So I mean, um, specifically what I want to do is take a limit where the ball is going to zero of the quantity um, entanglement entropy minus vacuum entanglement entropy. And in that limit, what you'd get is expectation value of T00 times some power of the radius. Yeah. And then you can strip off that power and then read off the... But uh, that radius would still be much bigger than any UV cutoff. Well, I, I mean, the, the quantity that I just defined is independent of the cutoff. Right, yeah, <laughs> it's in the continuum theory sometimes. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think, I think the quantity I defined is is cutoff independent, and so I don't, I don't need to worry about, you know, whether I'm. I mean, if, I if you wanted to, yeah, if you wanted to, absolutely, if you wanted to work with a cutoff, then you should probably, um, th then you should probably uh, make sure the ball is bigger. If than I that. have an area law, right, and that's the dominant term in the entanglement entropy, then it doesn't matter how small I make that region as long as it's not on the scale of the UV cutoff, the coefficient of the area was still going to be the same. So more or less. In, in the quantity I was looking at, it was the, it was the difference. Um, yeah, so I, I'm basically looking at this quantity yeah, where yeah, each yeah. of them has the same so uh, cutoff order behavior. One term. Yeah. yeah, so I'm kind of looking at the order one term. Order one term. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Vladimir. You need to know this local data over an extended period of time. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah, so you need to know. You, you need to know. Um, that's that's a good point, right? So so I'm I'm using the uh, the one point functions or the or the entanglement entropies um, as a function of space time on the boundary in the field. Mark. Mark. Yeah. So it is. It won't be so constrained if you allow matter, right? If I allow matter. Okay, so, uh, okay, well, I was going to talk about this more. If I allow matter, um, and I'm still, so if I said states dual to solutions of Einstein's equations with matter, okay, then I could replace um, expectation value of T mu nu with expectation value of all the local operators that correspond to the matter fields. Okay, so it's it, actually the conclusion is still true. Um, if I don't want to assume Einstein's equations, then I can make a, then the plausible statement is that the, uh, entanglement entropies for arbitrary regions can be uh, deduced from the entanglement entropy for ball-shaped regions. Okay, so it's it's still very very constrained. Okay. Um, great. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of. I mean, this is this that was just an example of um, of how entanglement is constrained, but uh, I think this is a big area for research. Um, <coughs> given states that have gravity duals. What is the entanglement structure um, consistent with this geometrical description? Um, you've uh, so there's a you know there's a bunch of work um, lately about how um, <coughs> maybe this structure is similar to uh, quantum error correcting codes that you've probably heard about that um, from Ahmed or uh, I don't know if Daniel was here. Um, and uh, so that that uh, that falls under this um, general area as well. There's a, there's a whole bunch of interesting. So it may be, and it may be that um, it may be that certain tensor network straight states have the right entanglement structure. Um, so there's lots of interesting work going on in this area. Okay. Um, if we could understand that, th the answer to that question, if one could understand um, more precisely, well, what is the structure that gives you? Um, Geometrical descriptions. Um, well, then a natural question is: Well, why do these holographic Hamiltonians 
uh, prefer states with this structure. If I look at uh, one of the Hamiltonians that's supposed to be describe a holographic field theory, um, why does that give me low energy? Why do low energy states for that Hamiltonian um, have this structure that then allows us to have a geometric interpretation? Okay. And so if you could answer this question and then answer this question, then I think you're really making progress on understanding how um, how ADS CFT works. And, okay. Um, so that was about understanding this, the structure and the field theory states that permit a gravitational description. Um, but another one of our big questions is, could we learn anything about gravity? And this already came up in one of the questions. Um, so one way that we could learn about gravity is by noticing that not all of the functions, so in my, in my picture where I had a ball, and this was, this was functions S of A, um, not all of those really correspond to consistent entanglement structures. Okay. Um, so so say, we have, uh, say we have a field theory, and we have two different regions. Okay. So an example of, of a constraint that you might be familiar with is the following, that the entanglement entropy of A plus the entanglement entropy of B minus the entanglement entropy of the union of those two, it's always positive. Mm -hmm. okay. So that, that follows from basic quantum mechanics. And so um, this, is, this is not going to be true if I just consider any possible function S of A. So there are many such constraints um, on entanglement entropies. I'll talk about several coming up. Okay. And so a way to, to depict that, so this was the set of all functions, S of A, functions on subsets of a boundary. Okay. So I've drawn in blue here. Those are all the ones consistent with all these entanglement in inequalities. Okay. So this one right here might not satisfy that inequality, okay? Um, or in this one right here might not satisfy some other inequality. Um, these ones are consistent with, these ones could potentially come from consistent quantum mechanical states. Uh, yeah? Are you assuming that the that state is pure or could it be? The, um, the, then the constraints are different, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we could consider both cases. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting to consider either pure or, or not pure. But, you know, in some cases, we might restrict to pure states. And, and, and that would be asking the question, you know, what, what geometries could be dual to pure states? But we, have, we know examples of geometries dual to mixed states. OK. Um, OK. So, Okay, so the really interesting point here is that um, there are geometries that I can write down where using the Ryu Takenagi formula to compute this function, it lands me in this region here. Okay. And so what that means is that that geometry is, it can't possibly be um, a physical geometry, at least in this, at least in this description of quantum gravity. Okay. If I start here and end up here, um, that's just not consistent with quantum mechanics. What, will you give an example of that? Yeah. Mark, I thought that kind of strong, strong subadditivity was a direct consequence of uh, Rutai Kanagi. Yeah, so it's, it's actually not. Um, <laughs> it, it, is in a special, it, it is in a restricted case. So I'll talk about this more um, in detail. Um, so Hedrick and Takinagi showed that in time independent situate for time independent geometries, if I consider strong subadditivity applied to regions that all sit on one spatial slice corresponding to a particular time, um, then you don't get any constraints. But it turns out that if you either consider time dependent geometries or even in the time independent case, if you try to, if you apply strong subadditivity to regions which are not on one of these preferred time slices, 
then you get non-trivial constraints. So, so, so when you say there are geometries which does not satisfy the uh, constraint on the entropy, actually, uh, those are still geometries satisfying the Einstein equation, solution of Einstein equations? So, you know, so far, these are just all possible metrics I could write down. Okay. Okay. So I'll get back to that. OK, so let me just say a, a few more. Let's see. Oh, I'm doing well. OK. So let me say a few more things about uh, some of these entanglement inequalities that are going to restrict um, this function S of A and, and, and hence restrict the possible uh, geometries we can get in our theory of gravity. Okay. So I already mentioned, uh, I already mentioned subadditivity. Okay. So that, that's um, you know, basically saying that the mutual information between region A and region B has to be positive. Um, there's a more powerful and more difficult to prove relation um, called strong subadditivity. Okay. Uh, that's basically saying that the mutual information uh, between the union of these two regions and this region is always bigger than the mutual or equal to the mutual information between this region and this region. Okay, which sounds really obvious to say, but is much more difficult to prove. Um, but that, that's another inequality like this one. Okay. Uh, another thing that turns out to be useful and relevant um, is uh, a property ca called the positivity of relative entropy, or a related one called <coughs> the monotonicity of relative entropy. Uh, so. Relative entropy, the definition, it's basically a way to uh, compare or distinguish two different density matrices. Okay. So if, if sigma and rho are density matrices for the same um, system, for the, say a subsystem of, of a larger system, um, then this quantity, um, well, it vanishes if, if they're <coughs> identical or it goes to infinity if, if they're uh, orthogonal. And so you can prove easily that it's always positive. And it's also larger uh, if I consider um, a larger subsystem. So I, I take the, for some global state, I look at the relative entropy for uh, a subsystem. Um, yeah, maybe I should. So in, in this ADS-CFT context, the, the thing that I have in mind would be to, to compare two states, let's say the vacuum state with some other state. Okay. And so the positivity of relative entropy would say that um, this density matrix for that region in this state um, and this density matrix for the same region in the vacuum state <coughs> have to obey this inequality. Or that has to be positive. And that quantity has to be larger if I, if I go to a slightly larger region um, and compute the same thing for the new density matrices, then the new relative entropy has to be larger. So let me, yeah, let me not get into the details there. Okay, so the, the point is that these are all things that follow from quantum mechanics, basically from algebra. Um, and they have to be true. They cannot be violated. Um, and so if you have a real state of an actual quantum field theory, then these will be satisfied. Okay. And all of these things it can be mapped over to statements about gravity assuming the Ryutaki-Nagi conjecture. Okay. And so what we want to do is basically now translate them all into statements about a gravity and, sit and, and ask, well, what, am, what do I learn? Okay. Okay, so let me just give you an example of how I would translate one of these statements. Um, so for example, strong subadditivity says that for three regions, this entanglement entropy plus this, this entanglement entropy is greater than or equal to this entanglement entropy plus that entanglement entropy. Okay. And using Ryu Takenagi, that translates geometrically to saying that, so here's, here are those three regions on the boundary 
okay, they're, they're, they're spatial regions. So I've, if I draw the time direction, then, then they look like this. Um, and then so for, for this union of regions A and B, there's some curve in the bulk, some surface in the bulk, um, which is extremal, whose boundary is the same as the boundary of A union B. And then I can compute the area of that. And strong subadditivity translates the statement that area of AB plus area of BC is greater than or equal to area of ABC plus area of B. Um, and this is not true for all geometries. Okay. So it, it is true if you have a time-independent geometry and A, B, and C lie on a preferred time slice. But in general, it's, it's not true. Okay. And I'll, give you, I'll, I'll mention um, an interpretation of this soon. What do you mean by preferred time slice? Oh, so in a time-independent uh, geometry, the preferred time slice would be, you know, uh, static, yeah, slice. static slice. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so to to start, if, you know, this is there's a huge set of inequalities. It's kind of a big program to try to figure out what all of that tells you about gravity. And a good place to start is with pure ADS. Okay. And now I go a little bit away from that. Okay. And just explore geometries that are close to ADS. And so these would correspond to field theory states that are close to the vacuum state, and I want to, within that little restricted set of things, um, understand what are these, what do all these inequalities tell me um, about the geometry? Um, so it turns out that the most constraining one is for this infinitesimal problem is the positivity of relative entropy. Um, OK, so remember, this was a quantity that, so here's, here's the relative entropy of some region between our state and the vacuum state. OK, so it's 0 for the vacuum state, because the vacuum state is the vacuum state. And as I go away from the vacuum state in any direction, it has to be positive. Okay. And so what that implies is that at first order, away from the vacuum state, the relative entropy has to be 0. Okay, so you actually get an inequality, which, uh, an equality, which is nice. Um, so why does the relative entropy have to be analytic at that point? Um, I mean, I can see from the geometry side, because you have some yeah. smooth deformation of a geometry, but just from a quantum mechanical point of view, it's not obvious. So, OK. I would, OK, so I, I could answer your question. So it turns out that the, the, the equality is something that I can derive without even mentioning relative entropy. Um, so just writing down the definition of, um, of entanglement entropy. OK, so if I start with trace of, of rho log rho, and then I vary it, okay. um, then, I get, uh, then I get the variation of the entanglement entropy um, is equal to something. Um, and I could just calculate what that is. Um, so, it turns out for, yeah, so it turns out for a ball-shaped region in a CFT, I can just calculate what it is. And it's expressible in terms of the stress energy tensor. Um, so I'll kind of evade your question by saying that I could just do a calculation. And this equality that I'm claiming is, is um, something that comes out of that calculation. For ball-shaped regions. For ball-shaped regions in CFTs, and that's all. Yeah, that's all I'm going to use. Um, yeah. So this is the formula. I'll, so, so um, let's just understand the formula. Okay. So we start with a vacuum state of a of a CFT. Pick a ball-shaped region. I vary the vacuum state. Of, so I go to some nearby state. Calculate the change in entanglement entropy, and then this is equal to um, the integral over the ball of some function of the radial coordinate um, times the stress energy tensor. Okay. Um, so this is this is the statement that follows from this first order variation. Okay. And this is uh, this again. This is an exact statement in all CFTs. 
So I can translate that one. So that's, that's the infinitesimal constraint. And I can translate it to geometry. It gives me a constraint on, on geometries, um, which are close to ADS. And the constraint is that those geometries have to satisfy the Einstein's equations. Equation. Um, perturbatively about ADS. Okay. So that's remarkable. Um, so you, you, you just started with this kind of basic constraint about quantum mechanics. Um, you assumed all, you know, we didn't really assume any, anything other than Ryutaki Nagi. So it's not really invoking the full structure of, of string theory and, and ADS CFT. We just have to say, um, suppose that there are, there's a geometry that represents the entanglement structure of a field theory by the Ryutaki Nagi formula. Um, then that geometry must satisfy the Einstein's equations um, if it's close to ADS. Is, so the, yeah, okay, so, so to linear order, um, if we're just working in the classical limit, um, then typically uh, like matter fields will, will have quadratic contributions to the stress energy tensor, and so they won't show up. Okay, so this, so um, classically to linear order, this is kind of just a statement about the metric. Um, but there's, there is a statement about the stress energy tensor if you include, okay, so if you include quantum corrections. Um, okay, so but basically you just add some gravity waves. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this, this, this sort of, we're not assuming anything particular about the matter, but to linear order, um, um, the constraint on metrics in any theory was just that it satisfies some differential equation that, that would not have a, um, they wouldn't, the matter fields wouldn't show up on the right-hand side. Okay, but actually, interestingly, if you, there is a way to um, to see that source term, and so this is this is work with Brian Swingle. Um, okay, so this goes a little bit beyond what I've said so far. Um, when I said that, you know, the CFT entanglement entropy is equal to uh, area in the gravity side. Okay. And even, even you know, the similar formula for uh, connecting black hole entropy and horizon area. Okay. Um, so that's actually understood to be something which is um, a leading order expression um, in, in, in a kind of a quantum gravity expansion. And there are corrections to this. Um, so there, in the past uh, years, people have understood corrections to this formula um, that would allow us to interpret um, the CFT entanglement entropy more precisely on the gravity side. Okay. And so the correction turns out to be that um, in, your, in the gravity side, um, you take the area of this extremal surface and then you add to it the bulk entanglement entropy of fields living in this region with fields outside. Sorry, I, I, I missed something really yeah. basic here. So actually, uh, the constraint on time entry is an inequality. How do you get an equation from inequality? Yeah, so this was the thing about the first order variation. Um, so if, if you have something, if you have, so one argument, uh, if you have something that's positive um, in any direction, um, then the first order variation has to vanish. Okay. Um, alternatively, I can just derive directly an inequality by varying the expression for entanglement entropy and then uh, doing a calculation. Yeah. So that was um, so that was an that was inequality. Okay. So the nonlinear things are all going to be inequalities. Um, yeah. Let me, actually, let me. Okay. So I'm going to put aside this for a second. Just just to continue on in the classical uh, limit, um, uh, I want to ask about um, constraints at the nonlinear level. Okay, so these are all inequalities. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's kind of ties into Eva's question. I mean, the, the, there's an interesting point here, which is that um, there's not just one theory that we think is dual to a gravity theory. Um, and there's not just one kind of consistent theory of quantum gravity. Um, 
in asymptotically empty to sitter space. So there's probably lots. There's probably lots of different matter I could have. And so you might get nervous that, um, you know, starting from some general kind of field theory argument, um, you know, if, if you were going to end up with just one set of classical equations, um, that, would be too, that, that would be too much to expect. Um, we're starting with something that's completely universal in field theory. And what we better end up with on the gravity side is something that's absolutely universal, something that applies to any um, kind of consistent theory of gravity in asymptotically anti to sitter space. Okay. And so, um, so one such statement is this linearized um, Einstein equation where the, where the um, matter doesn't appear on the right-hand side. Um, at the nonlinear level, we're going to get some inequalities. Um, and this is a, an area that we're currently exploring. I'll, I'll talk in detail about it next week. Um, but what it seems to be telling us um, uh, about the, the, you know, the general statement that it seems to be telling us about theories of gravity is some kind of energy conditions. Okay, so it, it, would, it seems to be, uh, at least in the cases that we've worked out, um, these entanglement inequalities are translating to things um, related to um, statements like the weak energy condition or the null energy condition that um, general relativists would have just taken as plausible um, statements about matter in, in consistent theories, but wouldn't have really had a way to derive. Um, and, and so what, what we seem to be seeing here is that given this uh, kind of consistent starting point for uh, describing your quantum theory of gravity in terms of a holographic field theory, um, you, you can actually derive some of these statements um, directly um, from entanglement inequalities. Okay. So I'll postpone that till the details of that till next week. Um, okay, getting back to this thing with, with Swingle. Um, so all of this stuff uh, that I mentioned so far, this stuff and the perturbative uh, Einstein equations, um, that was all kind of working in the classical, so we can work in a limit of the field theory, um, which corresponds to a classical limit on the gravity side. Um, but you can go away from that. The Ryu Takianagi formula, um, uh, there's been a, a proposed generalization where now the CFT entanglement entropy corresponds to area plus some bulk entanglement. Um, you can use that. Um, you can use that more precise formula um, to translate this exact field theory statement to gravity. So it becomes a statement about gravity um, now with some quantum fields in the bulk. Um, and then you see that um, on the right-hand side of this linearized Einstein equation is the bulk stress energy, the expectation value of the bulk stress energy tensor, um, um, like. Like relative to the vacuum um, stress energy tensor. Okay, so um, interestingly, at the at the quantum level, um, uh, this thing is is generally not uh, going to vanish even for um, fields with quadratic actions. You can have some contribution to that, and you see that it comes up. Yeah. For the variations you're considering, is it clear that the change in the area term is bigger than the change in the quantum correction term? Let's see if. So if you consider a very small change yeah. in the state, you would get a very small change in right, the area. Right, right. For sufficiently small, those two would be the same order. Yeah, that, OK, that's, um, that's a good question. I mean, you know, there's. I mean, there's some variations which would keep the area, but certainly change the quantum. That's, yeah, that's, that's right. I, I mean, I think it depends on exactly what, what you do. Um, I mean, there's actually situations there's actually situations where, you know, if, if you consider one of the bulk quantum fields is the graviton perturbation, right? And, and, yeah. and there, um, it's sometimes not even, you have to make a choice to say exactly where that shows up. Okay. Yeah, so that you right. get it, there, there are some issues um, about, um, you know, okay. understanding, so, you know, how to, how to split this up. You have to make some choices. But. So for the purely classical result, is there some further restriction on which variations you can consider to neglect the quantum term and just consider the? Area? Well, I, yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's I think it's clear in the classical that, that can work in the classical limit. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that's sort of that's sort of clear. Um, but then what, once I consider the the you know having quantum fields in the bulk, as Veronica said, I could probably consider variations where just those fields are changing a little bit. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, 
So I'm out of time, so here's the summary. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, it, it, it's almost like the most interesting possible um, result of, of this question of how do you combine gravity with quantum mechanics. Um, instead of having to, to, you know, force two things to fit together, um, you're really sort of seeing gravity um, emerge as some reinterpretation of statements about quantum mechanics. And so we've seen like the structure of entanglement in the field theory. Um, that is in, in these models um, how, how the space-time geometry is encoded. And um, dynamics of the space-time um, seems to be related directly just to constraints on entanglement that would just be derivable from quantum mechanics. Okay, so I'll stop there. Yes. I have a question. Um, so earlier in the talk, you used Ryu Takanagi applied to really small regions on the boundary to yeah. get a stress tensor, and then you did the sideways evolution. Yeah. And you said that um, it'll allow you to integrate inwards at least for some distance, and it might fail. And I was wondering if it fails, does that mean yeah? So this is a slide. Um, does that mean that there is non-local data involved, or just that that's not a good procedure? Yeah. So so um, I mean. I think there are actually experts in this room about w w when that fails. Um, but, um, you know, so so one of the really interesting uh, one of the really interesting things is, like for example, if, if you have a black hole horizon, um, you're not going to be able to, um, you know, get past that horizon. Um, and so, you know, I think Don raised some of these questions on Monday. Um, the, the question of how you know, in situations where you have uh, a black hole and maybe some geometry behind the horizon, the question of how that uh, would be encoded in the field theory um, is very much open. Couldn't it? I thought so, it could fail even without black holes. Yeah, even without black holes, it can f it um, it can fail. Who's it? You, you can just and it, your boundary data could not could it be the boundary data for something with like a naked singularity? You try to hit, integrate in and you just it, it breaks right because you hit a curvature singularity, for instance. Right, you could well, have that yeah, T00 is well, negative, right, and then it's a negative mass black hole. Yeah. Um, who, yeah, so who, there was a paper, uh, Ben, where's Ben? Where's Ben on this paper? Ben didn't come right okay, so you can, you can also fill in another way in the last step. Did you, that. Oh, did you, did you write, were, were you on this paper with Raphael where they? That was about continuity, wasn't that existence? Yeah, yeah, that, I think that's a more subtle question than, than this. Question that you're talking about. Well, I thought it was. It's uh, related, but. Okay, I thought it was directly related, but. It's not about coincidence with any problem. I don't know who was first. When you get a large radius gravity, so thinking about you know before and then it's Right. Such a necessary condition as a gas in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see that that's required for these considerations? So, yeah, I think okay, I th I, th I think I think that's going to come in. Um, this would take longer to. Uh, okay. I th it, it might be worth postponing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's an interesting. I mean, that that comes in like in. Um, no, where was it? Yeah, so that's kind of related to, to this. Okay, so I, you know, I think I think there's some entanglement structures that are required to have a geometrical description. Um, so that so far is just a you know a statement about the the state, um, and then you know I, I think there's going to be constraints on on Hamiltonians um, that will sort of um, in order to in order to give you states like that. Okay, and so that's kind of the place where I think um, these types of um, you know, constraints on spectra will come in. I, I have a more detailed answer uh, to that. As, as such, it will come from these very general principles about inequalities for table, which of course not be satisfied regardless. That, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the entanglement inequalities certainly um, certainly have to be satisfied regardless. But yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, that, that was that was the fair point. That you know, generally speaking, I can there's there's lots of things that satisfy those entanglement inequalities, and most of them are, are not going to give you gravity duels. Steve. So you and others have argued that entanglement gives you geometry. Uh, now, of course, we know that entanglement is implied by geometry in quantum field theory. You have a lot of entanglement, say, in the ground state, et cetera. But there are other things that come from geometry, too. And one example is, say, the structure of the Hamiltonian. Uh, you know, if you have two quantum systems or subsystems, yeah. uh, you know, say, an EPR pair, there's a question of whether or not uh, the interaction terms in the Hamiltonian uh, communicate information between them. Uh, and, and so that's another aspect of uh, you know the ge well of what we get from geometry, and it seems like it's more than entanglement. And so I wanted to ask the question about uh, you know well driving at whether you know really we should be thinking of entanglement as <coughs> sufficient for constructing geometry, or it's just one of the necessary conditions. Well, I mean, yeah, I think. This, this is the relevant ER slide. I mean, GPR yeah, you know, as well, which I think um, is morally in tune with. You know, this this picture right here, I, I think, captures the statement that you know entanglement um, is certainly not enough. Um, all of you know. Oh, let's go go to the one with the blue side, right? Okay. You know, I think I think this is the picture that anything in the blue region. Um, has entanglement and it, you know, has it's consistent with all these constraints on entanglement. Um, but it is very clear that um, only a very tiny subset of these things are really going to be interpreted as geometries. Okay, so, so you know, I think I think it's in no way sufficient to have a bunch of entanglement um, and then you get geometry. Uh, I mean, unless unless maybe you're willing to uh, vastly extend your notion of what geometry is. Right. Um, yeah. And so I think what you, I think what you need um, is, <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think there needs to be a, a principle here um, on the field theory side. I, you know, I have some, I, maybe I'll talk more about this on, on Tuesday. Yeah, that um, would be good. But, so so yeah. I, I think there needs, there's some principle here that, that further constrains the structure of entanglement. <coughs> That really allows you to, to go to the other side. Well, presumably, or well, yeah, it'd be good to hear more about it. But it seems like there should be additional structure beyond entanglement that's part of coming up with something like quantum geometry. Well, I mean, you know, if on the other hand, if so, if you have, uh, if you do give me a state that um, has a consistent gravity dual. Um, Computing all these entanglement entropies is, is sort of way, way more information than knowing a metric. So in that sense, you know, if, if you're in this, if you're guaranteed to be in that uh, little uh, subset of entanglement structures, um, I think I, I can deduce the geometry without uh, much further information. At least, you know, again, again, there are restrictions on how far I could go in. You know, there could well, be geometries. All of this pertains to semi-classical geometries, too. And I have no idea how it pertains to, you know, anything beyond the semi-classical limit. Well, you know, in, yeah, I mean, I would say that, in, you know, in some sense, it, it defines what's beyond the semi-classical limit, if you want. You know, if you want to say, well, Okay, area makes sense in the semi-classical limit. What is the quantity that generalizes that to things that aren't uh, semi-classical? Well, now you have all these entanglement quantities um, to fall back on that work for any states. So, so, but I, yeah, I think you know a big a, a big uh, uh, question that I think is really interesting is is to um, you know try to understand what we could, like, how do you interpret stuff beyond the semi-classical limit? Since I now have, like, a bunch of um, exact quantum quantities on this side, um, maybe you could you could interpret more precisely what's going on. Yeah? So you might ask uh, the same question already in the quantum information sort of theoretical context, right? If you have a, uh, a, a region and all subregions for which you know the entanglement entropy, 
how much about the reduced density matrix of the original region mm -hmm. does it actually really tell us? If you could actually re recover the reduced mm -hmm. density matrix, then, then you would be able to recover all these other uh, things that look like they're not just about entanglement. So I don't know how much is known in, I mean, from the entanglement side about how much you can right. recover. David. Um, also, in response to your last answer, okay. you used Utah Kanaki and the, a correction from the board. Yes. That was, as far as I understand, only the quadratic level, right? You know, it wasn't, that wasn't the exact, supposedly the exact, that was just. The, f the formula was. Oh, yeah. The correction. So that's right. One, if what you're saying is correct, Let's just take the entanglement spectrum or the main spectrum or right. all on a filter. You still need to generalize that. You yeah, that's that's right. I mean, unless you're really lucky and that's it. Um, but yeah, I, absolutely right. So there's an enormous step. This is in a sense a conservative reconstruction of quantum geometry at the lowest level. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, conf I'm confused about how much I. Yeah, I'm confused about how much I should uh, expect to be able to say in the fully quantum limit. Well, I'm, but, I'm sympathetic yeah. with using the quantum the boundary to define, right. even to define, to be the language. Mm -hmm. The language we're using so far is that of some classical geometries. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's certainly a, f a fair point. So far, beyond, we're working within. Going beyond some classical geometry, one that you know, would need some guidance as how to generalize RT. Surely, there's no reason why that quadratic thing would be useful. Right. I mean, yeah, but yeah. In so, I mean, in some sense, in that in that general framework, um, we don't. It's not, it's not so clear what the language should be. I mean, it might be just that you have to go to the entanglement language. But then, but. What is it telling you? Yeah, I mean, so you you know it could be that you have you have this you have this uh, I guess you have to think of what questions you want to answer. I mean, you know, part of it is you have this well-defined quantum theory, and um, you you could now use that to to um, you could ask which states define what we normally think of as, as semi-classical geometries, and then answer questions about those. But I guess, yeah, you need to come up with what, what question do you want to ask about going beyond that on the gravity That's a side? Good question. Because the answer is yours. Yeah, so yeah, we, should quick, we should do a little bit of the spectrum itself. Yeah, that's so. That's a good question. I mean, there's a, there's a pretty well defined answer. Um, I mean, so the spectrum um, um, is somehow equivalent to the set of Renyi entropies, and um, it seems like so. So there's a prescription for calculating these Renyi entropies as some kind of gravitational path integral. Um, um, but apart from the entanglement entropy, it doesn't seem like any of them um, correspond to something really nice and geometrical. Although, um, yeah, I mean, I had an so. I mean, I could just. I'm not sure that's true. At some point, I at some point I thought there would be a, a nice answer to that. Um, so, um, you know, if if you think about, all right. Okay. So let let me draw um, a different picture of ADS with time. Um, okay. So here is a. A particular time, and so this this is a you know say this the field theory is living on a compact space like a sphere or a ball. Um, so a while back, um, I considered with some collaborators the question of what information about the bulk geometry do you get by knowing the density matrix for. <coughs> for, say, half of the space. 
And there's some, there's some particular wedge, so we, we made some proposal. Um, there's some particular wedge of the bulk geometry, um, which ends on this. This is the, this is the Ryu Takianagi or the Kibini uh, Rangamani Takianagi surface. And then if you look at the density matrix for um, the other half of the space, um, we argued that that corresponds to some other wedge of the bulk geometry. Okay. Now, the entanglement spectrum, uh, one way to characterize that would be to say that it's the information that's common to this density matrix and this density matrix, assuming a pure state of the whole system. Okay. And then if you, if you look at the, the, the bulk picture, um, you say, well, what is, the, what is the information that's common to this wedge over here and this wedge over here? Um, well, it's, it's basically this uh, Ryu Takinagi surface. It's this extremal surface. And so the entanglement entropy computes the area of that. Um, but there's, there's more information. You know, it has a geometry, and ha there's a lot more information. I could write down lots of, of quantities, like the integral over that um, surface of all kinds of other things, curvatures. or So there's lots of other kind of local uh, or extrinsic curvatures. There's lots of properties of that surface. And so at some point, I, I thought that the answer to that question would be that you know, these other properties of that surface um, would be related to the entanglement spectrum. But I'm, so far, that hasn't panned out. But I don't know. Maybe that's for lack of work. Uh, so, uh the system has gravity dual. I thought there were inequalities which are not generally true, but are true in this case. Suppose I just take yeah. those inequalities, which are not generally true, but yes. true Do they give you some information about, I don't know, the, for example, the kind of question Eva was asking about spectrum of the bulk theory? I mean, that there has to be some, uh, is there any, yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of related to, that's basically this, this point. So the thing that it tells you dir directly um, is you know, some very strong, so these inequalities that you were talking about um, are, for example, inequalities that help place you on this region in, in entanglement space. Um, so I wouldn't say it directly tells you about, yeah, OK. So I mean, it directly tells you about entanglement structure. And then, I mean, given. Um, the question of what, you know, which Hamiltonians will prefer that entanglement structure, it should, in, in principle, tell you about um, right. Hamiltonians. But, but so far, n specific. nothing really concrete. I don't have a concrete thing. In fact, is it, is it even known that those are strong restrictions? I mean, I realize there are things that are not, that are not in general true of all quantum states. Yeah. But at least inequalities I was aware of, I had the impression might be reasonably natural consequences of large N. So the your yeah so the uh, there's an example for example the so-called triple information right, the, the mutual information the negativity of triple information yeah I mean so these that those things are are rather weak um, <coughs> right compared with so you know for example compared with this constraint that I mentioned here um, that's a much stronger it's right. far far stronger the, the the set of constraints should take you from this whole space of functions down to uh, yeah, a and tiny, tiny subset. The um, yeah. yeah. That's right. And uh, just one more question. Can I ask another question? So yeah. you're, you're perturbing the ground state and looking at trace the, the uh, relative entropy pulse derivative. You perturb. Sure, yeah. If I take some, did you, if I perform the same thing with highly excited state, right. would you get? So yeah, we okay. So the the catch there is that um, you to to do that comparison, um, you need to know uh, about the modular Hamiltonian for the reference state. Right, but you and, know, in many cases, that is known. Um, so we could talk about, I mean, yeah. I, in, there are only a few cases where I know the answer. Um, and so we did look at, um, so in the context of, uh, in the context of two-dimensional conformal field theories, um, we considered these constraints where the reference state was 
taken to be any um, thermal state, any any boost, any thermal state. Actually, it could be a boosted thermal state. Okay. So we did consider sort of um, some like two-parameter family of reference states. Do you find some more interesting and than you find? Yeah, you do find, you do, you do find I mean, basi basically the, <coughs> one of the interesting um, things was that the strongest constraint, um, given a family of reference states, um, the strongest relative entropy constraints seem to come from um, the reference state that matched the local data, like the, the local expe like the expectation values of the stress tensor, for example. If you choose the reference state that matches with the, those one-point functions in your state, that will give you the strongest constraint, as you might expect. Okay, so it's good time to end it. So thank you again.